Hey folks, we are here to talk about the French Revolution, and as always, we'll start with the goal for the screencast. By the end of this, you should be able to say that you can explain all three aspects of the Revolution's model for the French Revolution. And to prove this to me, you're going to show me your notes in whatever form you would like. You'll also show me your Revolution's note taker, which is page six of your unit packet. A little bit of context for the French Revolution. Uh, France was very, very severely in debt. They were spending way more money than they were taking in. Um, and the, the social system in, in place in France uh, pre the French Revolution was known in the, as the old regime. And this is just the way France had been for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and the old regime divided society into f three groups. And these groups were called estates. The first estate, which was a very small percent of the population, um, was the, the churchmen, the, the clergy. The second estate was the super rich noble folk. And then finally, the third estate was the vast, vast majority, 97% of the population. And this was everybody else. We've got the churchmen, the nobles, and everybody else. And a couple things that you should know about the old regime. Um, first, there's your, there's your pie charts. You can see third estate, vast majority of the population. Um, the first and second estate owned a hugely disproportionate amount of land based on how much or what percentage of the population they were. Also, as you can see, the first and second estate owned both a disproportionate amount of land, but they also paid a tiny, tiny amount of their income in taxes. The third estate, the vast majority of France, was paying half of their income in taxes, while the first estate and the second estate were paying just fractions of their income in taxes. In terms of what France was spending all this money on, uh, a reasonable amount, about a quarter on military expenditures, um, about a quarter on, or excuse me, about half on payments on debt. Uh, and you can also look and see that the French king, he, uh, he spent some money. We'll talk about him in a couple minutes. In addition to the unfair taxation, representation was also unfair in the old regime. The legislative branch was known as the Estates General, and within the Estates General, each estate only got one vote. That meant the clergy, 1% of the society, got one th had one-third of the voting power. The nobles, 2% of society, had one-third of the voting power. The third estate, 97% of society, only had one-third of the voting power as well. So the first and second estate paid very little in taxes, they owned a disproportionate amount of land, and they had to spend, or excuse me, they wielded unnecessary, not unnecessary, disproportionate influence within the Estates General. There were also some other kind of more pressing problems brewing. Louis XVI was an extremely unpopular king. Uh, he inherited a huge amount of debt from his father and spent a ton of money on his palace, which was known as Versailles. If you want to see something crazy, check out the Palace of Versailles. His wife was an Austrian woman named Marie Antoinette, and there was a lot of kind of rivalry going on in Europe in this time period, and because of Marie Antoinette's Austrian roots, she was not trusted. She spent a ton of money on her clothes as well, so both the king and the queen, they put out quite a bit of cash to, to, to look good. Another thing that kind of happened that was angering people was Louis XVI finally called a meeting of the Estates General um, because France was bankrupt, and this happened in 1789. And the Estates General, while they had been around, they hadn't been used in almost 200 years. And the members of the Third Estate saw this as an opportunity, and they decided that each person, not each estate, should get one vote. They were trying to recapture a little bit of power in France since the Estates General hadn't met in nearly 200 years. The first and second estate decided that this was a giant threat to their privilege and locked the first and or locked the third estate out of the, the the room the estates general met in. The third estate went to a tennis court and swore a tennis court oath or swore what became known as the tennis court oath that they would not leave this tennis court until they had a new constitution that was more fair written up for the French people. They created the National Assembly, which was the new legislative branch, and Louis the Sixteenth soon ordered the first and second states to join this national National Assembly. Um, as this was happening, as this kind of revolutionary upheaval was beginning to kind of bubble closer to the surface, um, the French citizens got very concerned about uh, a foreign invasion to maybe from the Austrians to try to prop up Louis the Sixteenth and Marie, and they headed to, on, on July 14th, 1789, the citizens headed to the Bastille, which was a prison in Paris, in order to get gunpowder and to get weapons to defend themselves.
This is an extremely famous uh, time period in France, obviously, um, and the storming of the Bastille uh, is, is represented in many works of art. Uh, here's one of them. Um, again, very chaotic. There's some death going on there. They were after guns. So the National Assembly soon began to reform France, and they passed something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And this was passed uh, on August 27th <coughs> by the National Assembly, and it was heavily influenced by the events of the American Revolution and the documents of the American Revolution, and it emphasized legal equality, that people of all three estates should have the same rights. As this revolutionary fervor kind of continued to bubble through France, um, a group of women got very angry in October of 1789 about the shortage of food that was going on throughout France. And 7,000 women marched from Paris to Versailles, this the palace of Louis and Marie that was out in the country, uh, in order to try to get food from the king. And they forced the king and queen to return to Paris from their splendid palace in Versailles with them. In 1791, Louis and Marie tried to escape from Paris in a, I believe it was in a horse-drawn carriage under disguise. They were caught and taken back to the, and taken back to Paris. Um, whatever, random anecdote. Uh, in 1792, a constitution was written that severely limited the power of the king and gave far more power to the National Assembly, which again was far more equally, the, the, which divided the power far more equally towards the third estate. Um, and in 1792, France officially became a republic, and Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette were publicly executed for their crimes against the French people in 1793. But things are about to get crazy. After the king was executed, there was a huge struggle among a bunch of leaders to try to gain control of France. Um, one of the groups that was struggling to gain power was a group known as the Jacobins, and there was a guy, his name was Marat, he died in a bathtub, that was part of that group. Marat actually wrote propaganda for the Jacobins. And Maximilien Robespierre emerged from this chaos <clears throat> and came to power in France. Robespierre ruled as a dictator for a couple years, and while, while this was going on, he executed 40,000 people that he deemed were enemies of the Revolution. The vast majority of these were tried with little or no trial. Again, that was why Charlotte Corday ended up killing Marat, was that some of her friends were executed by um, information that Marat had passed on to Robespierre. Also, 85% of the people killed during the Reign of Terror were peasants, and these folks were the folks the Revolution was supposed to be for. And instead of that, they end up getting killed in a disproportionate number. Robespierre was guillotined, and a guillotine is just a, a fancy machine that would cut off heads that was used to kill the vast majority of these 40,000 people that were killed during the Reign of Terror. And Robespierre was killed in 1794 via guillotine and was viewed as an enemy of the revolution, even by his own people. After Robespierre dies, a group called the Directory ends up ruling France for four years. And the Directory was just chaotic, incredibly weak. It had two parliaments, five directors, power was split up among a huge group of people, and was disliked by the vast majority of the French people. The military in France had to put down a whole ton of uprisings during this time period because the Directory and the way they were ruling was just so roundly disliked by the French people. This dude, Napoleon, the guy with his hand in his pocket, uh, rose out of the directory and came to power. He got to be famous as a military general and took advantage of all just the ridiculousness going on in France, this very weak government, and took power in 1799. He ruled France as a dictator until 1815 and conquered a whole bunch of Europe. Um, however, he made a mistake that we'll talk about several more times throughout our two years together. Um, he invaded Russia and ended up getting defeated by the Russian winter, but that's neither here nor there. So this was kind of a, a very broad stretch of time, um, and if you look back on the French Revolution, there were some good things that came out of it. Napoleon reformed the tax system and eased the tax burden on the third estate. He allowed for freedom of religion and also created a system of public education. However, there are also some cons about the French Revolution. Um, if you look at how the, the American Revolution and the Glorious Revolution were revolutions that stuck, that made permanent change, um, the French Revolution started with an absolute monarch and ended with a dictator. So you still had an absolute leader at the end of the French Revolution. 
Also, just the huge amount of violence and death during the Reign of Terror was obviously troublesome to the French people. And finally, the Napoleonic Code, the set of laws that Napoleon made, actually took rights away from the French citizens. So there were some cons that went along with some of the pros of the French Revolution. So that is our screencast on the French Revolution. Uh, if you can look back and explain all three aspects of the revolution's model for this revolution, excellent. If not, talk to me, talk to a classmate, rewatch re the screencast. Again, I'm going to be looking for your revolution's note taker as well as your notes in whatever form you took them to prove that you watched this screencast. Thanks.